Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of Lifespan.io and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. Rejuvenation biotechnology continues to pick up steam with major companies, political activism, and new approaches on the horizon. Let's see what's been done in January. Starting off with our research roundup. Scientists have transferred the neuroprotective effects of exercise to mice that are sedentary via plasma transfusion and identified an obscure protein that might be responsible for the effect. Back in 2005, a paper by Irina and Michael Conboy outlined the anti-aging effects of heterochronic parabiosis, which is the exchange of blood between young and old mice whose cardiovascular systems have been linked together. In those experiments, old mice were rejuvenated by the young blood, while the conditions of the young mice worsened. Later, the convoys shifted their attention to diluting old blood plasma, which largely recapitulates the benefits of blood exchange. Until now, very few experiments have been conducted that involved exchange of blood plasma between similarly aged animals. In this new study, the researchers took this untrodden path, treating sedentary young mice with the blood plasma of regularly exercising mice of the same age. In their experiment, the researchers divided young male mice into two groups, those that had running wheels in their cages and those that did not. The mice in the first group readily used the wheel, while the mice without wheels had much fewer opportunities to flex their muscles. The researchers observed that 28 days of running improved various health parameters, including overall neuron survival, the number of neural stem and progenitor cells, and the number of astrocytes, which are glial cells that perform maintenance tasks in the brain. Then, two groups of sedentary mice received a transfusion of plasma from either the exercising mice or other sedentary mice. Amazingly, most of the beneficiary effects of running were transferred to sedentary mice via the runner's plasma. Mice that received this plasma showed a notable increase in the proliferation and survival of hippocampal cells compared with the other mice. This exciting new research proves that exercise changes blood plasma composition and that some of the beneficiary effects of exercise can be transferred between organisms via plasmapheresis. Scientists have combined the popular antibiotic rifampicin with resveratrol to create a possible preventative treatment for age-related dementias age-related dementias, such as Alzheimer's disease, still defy current treatment options, impeding attempts to increase human lifespan. According to the theory of competing risks, we cannot hope to meaningfully increase lifespan until all lethal diseases of aging are addressed, because if an elderly person escapes one age-related disease, such as cancer, that person will likely succumb to another disease, such as dementia. This makes finding a cure for age-related dementias a pressing issue. These diseases have something in common, their progress is linked to the accumulation of misfolded proteins in the brain. This results in the formation of plaques and tangles that appear at the clinical stage of the disease. Yet, since attempts to clear those plaques have not led to meaningful alleviation of the symptoms, researchers are beginning to suspect that the treatment should begin much earlier at the preclinical stage and target the protein's oligomers. Amyloid oligomers are formed from single amyloid molecules and serve as building blocks for the plaques, but they are also highly neurotoxic on their own. In 2016, these researchers had shown that a well-known antibiotic, rifampicin, can inhibit the oligomerization of proteins in vitro and improve cognition in dementia-prone mice. Unfortunately, rifampicin can be toxic. The scientists search for a compound that would be safe, counteract some of rifampicin's toxicity, and preferably exert additional neuroprotective effects. Screening for such a compound yielded a result that will be familiar for many in the longevity field, resveratrol. The combination treatment was tested in various transgenic mouse models of dementia, starting when oligomer pathology and cognitive dysfunction were already detectable but still at a stage that corresponded to the preclinical stage of neurogenerative dementia in humans. The combination treatment matched or surpassed the effect of rifampicin alone, even at lower concentrations. This is important since lower dosage means lower toxicity. Despite the cognitive improvement, there was no significant change in the abundance of amyloid plaques. According to the authors, This supports the hypothesis that anti-dementia treatments should target oligomers rather than plaques.
In the first human trial of its kind, scientists showed that a fasting-mimicking diet can work synergistically with conventional therapies in cancer patients, altering their metabolisms and reshaping their immune systems. Fasting is shaping up to be a powerful addition to clinical practice. It is not a panacea, but it can exert a profound effect on the human body. By altering metabolic pathways, periodic fasting can help maintain normal weight, reduce inflammation, lower blood pressure, and beneficially alter the gut microbiome. This study consisted of 101 cancer patients receiving various oncological therapies. Cancer stages and types varied from patient to patient. The patients underwent several cycles of 5-day restrictive fasting mimicking diets followed by 16 to 23 days of refeeding, depending on each patient's anti-cancer regimen. In accordance with previous research, the fasting-mimicking diets reduced median plasma glucose levels by 18.6%, serum insulin by 50.7%, and serum IGF-1 by 30.3%. These metabolic changes were correlated neither with tumor type and stage nor anti-cancer treatment. The researchers used two control groups, nine healthy volunteers who underwent the same dietary regimen and 13 patients with advanced breast cancer on standard chemotherapy who were not subjected to a fasting-mimicking diet. The first group experienced metabolic changes similar to the study group, while the second group did not. In some of the participants, the effect of the diet on the immune system was analyzed. The researchers learned that this diet reshapes the immune system in a way that promotes its anti-tumor activity. In addition, the diet increased the amount of cancer-fighting cells, both systemically and on the tumor level. According to the researchers, this resulted in an enrichment of immune signatures previously associated with good prognosis and or better response to therapies in patients with cancer. That's it for our research roundup. You can find more on these and other stories on our website at lifespan.io forward slash roundup. Some more videos from our Ending Age-Related Diseases conference have been released, including a talk by João Pedro de Mejalies discussing the future of longevity biotech. Here's the beginning of his presentation. I'm sure you're aware, but you probably don't like to think about it. Uh, we are all going to die. And um, if we don't do something about aging, it is going to be fairly soon, I would argue, at least from a cosmological perspective. Uh, now, back when I was a, a child, I realized this. I realized, you know, everybody ages and dies. And I figured, you know, I'll, I'll do something about aging. I will find a cure for aging, just like we can find cures against diseases, like, you know, infectious diseases. And we have antibiotics that can cure diseases that we couldn't treat, you know, not that long ago. Um, I will fix aging. That's that's what I'm going to do in my career. So, so it's not about, um, you know, just, just money or other um, goals, my goal is to find a cure for aging. So that's the goal. And of course, things have advanced a lot in the past uh, few decades. Uh, we know in particular that aging can be retarded. Actually, we've known that aging can be retarded for quite a long time. Um, so from a perspective of caloric restriction in particular, we know that we can retard delay aging in mammals, specifically in rodents, um, by caloric restriction. So that's been known for about, uh, at least 80 years. Um, so, so we know that aging can be retarded. And you see there a, a, a plot of rats fed at libitum and fed uh, under caloric restriction. There is a significant difference. It varies between strains, but you can see an increase in lifespan up to 50% in some strains. And it, it retards the process of aging, delays age-related diseases. We also know that aging can be manipulated. It can be retarded genetically in, in model systems like worms, flies, and mice. Um, Lorna mentioned this a little bit earlier today in her talk. Um, thanks to the work of pioneers like Cynthia Kenyon, now at Calico, we know you can tweak genes and significantly extend lifespan in animal models, which, which is, again, quite remarkable. Um, and likewise, we now know of drugs that can retard aging in animals. Um, we've heard a bit about rapamycin already and metformin. So, you know, I, I'm sure this audience is, is familiar with these developments. We know that there are longevity drugs that at least in animal models, they can retard age, they can extend lifespan. The only thing that's important to mention here to emphasize is that the benefits of this, well, the longevity effects are relatively modest when compared to, to other interventions like caloric restriction or genetic manipulations in particular. So I think rapamycin extends lifespan like 10, 15%, depending on males or females. Um, metformin, uh, I believe um, less than that. Um, so, so we have 
um, we have many ways of extending lifespan with pharmacological approaches, but effects are smaller than what you see uh, with, for example, genetic manipulations. Um, and there's lots of interest in longevity pharmacology, basically because if we're going to translate findings from, uh, from model systems to humans, I mean, we cannot, at least not yet, do genetic manipulations. We, we have to do pharmacological approaches. It's the low hanging fruit that, I mean, Aubrey alluded to earlier on. There are some difficulties. I mean, I'm very excited personally about longevity drugs. Um, there's challenges. There is a gap of you know, translating discoveries between animal models and humans, not just in aging, but, but I would say in biomedical research in general and for many diseases. So that, that's a, a challenge that we are aware of. Um, so not everything we discover in animal models is gonna pan out in humans, but possibly something will. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm relatively optimistic in that sense. I know not everything is going to work in humans, but some things are going to work in humans. And if they do, and they retard aging in humans, then that's going to be uh, a tremendous benefit. And of course, there's tremendous uh, financial benefits as well. And that's why we have this fast growth in longevity biotech, in the longevity industry. Our other channel, Science to Save the World, has released a series of videos on cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. The first video consists of an overview of this technology and how it works. The second discusses how blockchain is being used to make a positive impact on humanity, and the third discusses the environmental impact of blockchain and what we might be able to do about it. These videos can be found on the Science to Save the World YouTube channel and Facebook page. Meanwhile, a new episode of Lifespan News looks into whether or not Altos Labs, a biotechnology startup that just exited stealth with a team of leading scientists and $3 billion in funding from investors that reportedly include Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, is a longevity company. Here's some of that. We've already covered how the reportedly Jeff Bezos-backed biotech company Altos Labs just exited stealth mode to announce $3 billion in funding and a team full of Nobel Prize winners and pioneers from academia and business. According to their website, they are focused on cellular rejuvenation programming to restore cell health and resilience with the goal of reversing disease. This caused a lot of excitement in the longevity community, which may have come as a surprise to the Altos Labs team since they insist that they are not an anti-aging or longevity company. In an article published by Endpoints News on January 19th, Altos Labs founder and chief scientist Rick Klosner is quoted as saying, We do not view this as either an aging company or a longevity company, and I feel really strongly about that. And I think the science that's going to emerge shows that yes, you can make cells that get dysfunctional over time healthier and more resilient, but it's independence of age. This is something we've heard directly from the company's representatives as well. The news team at Lifespan.io reached out to Altos Labs to find out more, and they received a response saying, quote, Altos is not an anti-aging or longevity company. However, this messaging either didn't make it far or was largely ignored, because numerous media outlets and content creators referred to Altos as an anti-aging company or similar, and it's not something we've shied away from here at Lifespan News. And I think it's understandable why. Many of the notable leaders and scientists now affiliated with Altos Labs have been known for years for their work in aging research, and in many cases have been active participants in conferences and events within the longevity community. And the work that they are doing now at Altos appears to be very similar to their previous work, work that has been called aging research. So when Rick Klausner says that Altos is focused on reversing the dysfunction that occurs in cells over time, and that they seek to rejuvenate cells to a healthier and more resilient state, but that that's independent of age and does not make them an anti-aging company, I think the real issue here is a semantic dispute. It comes down to what we mean by aging. Are we talking about chronological age? Biological age? Age-related diseases? To be fair, I can appreciate where Rick Klosner and the Altos team are coming from. There is no shortage of snake oil and pseudoscience, and fringe quasi-religious beliefs when it comes to the quest to overcome aging. It's been in our stories for millennia, and in those tales, it typically doesn't go too well for the characters involved in that pursuit. A number of people still have an aversion to the idea of trying to extend healthy human lifespan, and even some of those who fully embrace the endeavor are not rooted in science and rationality, but in misplaced hopes and gullibility. There are a number of reasons for a for-profit company with a lot at stake to want to control their branding and messaging, 
making sure that the focus is on the science and medical breakthroughs, and not on who their investors are or anyone's wild ideas about immortality. And the situation probably wasn't helped by the fact that the first public announcement of Altos Labs, which came in an MIT Technology Review article from Antonio Regalado, featured a headline about living forever, and a poorly photoshopped image of Jeff Bezos as a knight playing a game of chess with death. This is probably not the visual that Altos Labs wanted people to think of when they hear the company's name. And that's just one article. Others talked about bionic billionaires, and immortality, and the fountain of youth. Media outlets want clicks, because that gives them attention and ad dollars. Sensationalism and outrage can generate those clicks, and this can overshadow the branding and messaging that a company such as Altos, and the scientists within it, really feel should be highlighted. Ultimately, the technology that Altos Labs is working to develop may be able to reverse the damage and dysfunction that accumulate in cells as part of the biological aging process. This could, in theory, revert people to what we would call a younger biological age, even if their chronological age continues to increase. And this has the potential to increase their health span and their lifespan. So while Rick Klausner and others feel strongly that Altos Labs is not an anti-aging or longevity company, and while I understand why they would want to frame things in that way, I think there's more than enough justification for people to refer to Altos Labs as such. At a minimum, I think we can safely refer to them as a rejuvenation company, since that's a word that Altos Labs uses in their own messaging. And rejuvenation is a viable approach to tackling aging. A system that rejuvenates faster than the damage of aging accrues will never experience those problems. However, if Altos Labs doesn't want to be associated with longevity, that's a clear indication that there's a branding problem with it, and it's up to all of us to correct that. This will be a topic that we address in future videos, so please subscribe so you can be a part of that solution. You can find this episode of Lifespan News and others like it on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Lifespan News. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. <laughs>